Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church. Healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Ashley, and I am so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, pen, and paper, your phone, however you want to take notes, and get ready for today's message. I'm enjoying this study. If you have not uh, been here for any of the Armor of God, I ask you to go back to our website. Go watch the previous messages. It is a very well-rounded, well-studied uh, topic of the armor of God, teaching in a way that maybe you haven't heard it before, especially even today. Today we're talking about nice kicks. Nice kicks. Anybody call their sneakers kicks? Like if you call your sneakers tennis shoes, I don't... I don't even know what to say. I'm, I'm at a loss for words. Sneakers, right? Sneakers are kicks. Nice kicks. I didn't wear nice kicks today. I wore my Toms today just so that I wasn't too flashy for the idea of sneakers, of footwear, of shoes. But today our series is Ephesians chapter 6. And Ephesians 6.14 says this, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. We talked about that. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, we talked about that, and having shod your feet. Did you guys shod your feet today? Anybody do some shodding? <laughs> shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This is what we're going to study today. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Historical information. The Roman soldier... His shoes were not ordinary shoes. And the first place they were made out of bronze or brass, there was no Dr. Scholl's insoles for these shoes. Okay, they were very hard, very structured. Um, and they were made of two components. The first component was something called the greave. The greave went from the top of the knee all the way down the shin to the top of the foot, both sides, tube, a tube-like a uh, piece of metal that the soldier had to slip on. Could you imagine trying to wear someone's greave that had tiny calves? Ain't gonna work. Ain't gonna, unless you have tiny calves too. These pieces of armor were custom made per soldier. Per soldier. So like my dad, my dad has ginormous calves. Like, they're ridiculously large for the size leg he has. I mean, my dad's like five foot four, and he's all calf. You know what I mean? <laughs> Sorry, Dad. I know you're watching online. But they would be custom made per soldier. This is why David said to Saul, when Saul said, hey, wear my armor. David said, I, I've tried. I can't put this on. I haven't proved this armor. It's not custom fit for me. The, the greaves were custom fit, custom sized per soldier, and so was the shoe. So you had the greave, and then you had the shoe itself. These shoes were exceptionally dangerous. Besides having just the, the greave that, you know, you could protect yourself if someone was to kick or to, or to throw a sword, you know, you could like do like, ah, you know, whatever. The shoes were also made out of bronze or brass, two pieces, one on the top of the foot, one on the bottom of the foot, and they were laced together around to hold it tight. On the bottom of the bottom of the shoe, depending on how the soldier wanted it, there would be anywhere from a one inch to a three inch spike sticking out of that shoe. You could see that that would be pretty dangerous if you got kicked in the head. Huh? You know, I was about to try a kick, and uh, I don't think it would end well for me to try to do a kick. So one time, <laughs> one time, one time I, I, wanted to do, I wanted to learn karate. Like, I always wanted to do karate as a kid, so as a grown adult, I went to go do karate, and I'm in this class with all these little kids. <laughs> and, the, and the teacher makes us do like a front kick. So I, want to, I was like, I was all into this too, man. I was like eight-year-olds all around me, and I'm like, yeah, and I'm going to do this front kick. And I'm like that to do a front kick, and I had so much energy, I let the other foot out, and wham, I, hit, I knocked myself out right in the middle of the class. I ain't doing that today. 
All right. So you had the greave and you had the shoe. Three pieces of metal to make this piece of armor what it was. The bottom of the foot had a spike on it, and you could understand why now it was an active piece of armor, not just for protection, but also for an offensive weapon. This is what Paul had in mind when he said, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. These were dangerous, dangerous pieces of weaponry in their armor, and it's so contrary to the word peace. Because when we hear the word peace, we think of rainbows and doves and butterflies. Not a dangerous offensive weapon that could take somebody out with a kick. Yet, that's exactly what Paul has in mind when he says to wrap peace around your feet. Peace not only protects you, but it also provides you with a brutal weapon to wield against the enemy when he attacks. And if you use the weapon correctly, it will keep the spiritual enemies at bay away from you and keep them under your feet. Paul says this, have your feet shod. The word shod is derived from the Greek word hupodemia. And it means binding together very tightly at the bottom of one's feet. Now, can I ask you guys a question? How many of you guys like your shoes loose? And how many of you like your shoes choked? Anybody choke their shoes? Dear God, have mercy on your soul. <laughs> like, when shoes are too tight on me, it almost makes me feel claustrophobic. That's like, people who choke their, I'm sorry, Jason, but people who choke their sneakers are almost as bad as people who wear socks to bed. <laughs> it's the same category. They both need to repent and find Jesus. <laughs> but I also don't like my shoes too loose, especially if you're trying to play basketball. Have you ever tried to play basketball with loose shoes? One, you're going to catch a broken ankle, right? Because you're trying, to, you're trying to defend somebody, and they're coming down, and they're making moves left and right, and you roll an ankle real easy with loose shoes. But also with loose shoes, your foot is sliding around inside that shoe, and I don't know about you, but I get blisters quick like that. This idea right here means to bind together the shoe very tightly. It would take that piece of leather that was wrapping the top shoe and the bottom shoe and pull it tight, choke it, tight, 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 tightly fixed to the foot. It was done in such a way that you couldn't even really do it yourself. Like, could you imagine trying to have all this armor on and then get that shoe just right? You couldn't do it. Many times you would have an armor bearer or a servant help you put that armor on, right? Because it's not really the arm... You, you don't put your own armor on. It's put on you by God, the armor of God, right? Not the armor of Mike. The armor of God is put on me, and I can't really lace it like that. I'm going to need some help, God, lacing this piece tightly to my life, binding something very tight. This was not the picture of a loose-fitting garment or a loose-fitting shoe. This picture of the shoe has been tied to the bottom of the foot, I'm gonna say it one more time just so you get it, extremely tight. And Paul uses this word to tell us how, how to firmly tie peace around our lives. I want you to get this today. Paul is saying that we need to tie peace so tightly to our life that when circumstance and trials and issues come, it cannot be easily knocked out of place. Are you getting this? Right? Now, are there any shoe kickers in here? Shoe kick. What is that? 
person who keeps their shoes like slightly tied, untied all the time so they can just kick them off and slip them on. They don't actually tie their shoes. Shoe kickers. How many shoe kickers up in the house? All right, y'all shoe kickers. This is not a shoe kicking kind of thing. This ain't a shoe kickers kind of thing. You couldn't kick these shoes off. You weren't slipping into these. And you know the problem with having, yo, tell me right now, you shoe kickers, that you haven't been walking around and someone catches you a flat tire. You know what flat tire is? <laughs> flat tire is when someone steps on the back of your shoe while you're walking and all of a sudden you're trying to walk like this. And, oh, God. Dang. Oh, man. Get my shoe. You know? Now, I did it first service. I kicked my shoe off and I tried to go partly without my shoe tied and I just could not do it. It was sinful. I almost had to repent. So let me get one second. Just tie my shoe back. All right. I got to get put back together. That was not going to happen if your shoes were tied right. And that's not going to happen to your peace if it's tied right. A circumstance isn't going to come. Someone's not going to get you angry. Well, they just pushed my button. They didn't catch you a flat tire. Someone can't catch your piece of flat tire if you got it tied tight. You, you know why you lost your piece? You know why you caught a spiritual flat tire? Because your piece wasn't tied tight. Right? You had shoe kickers on. You had kickers on. You didn't tie that piece tight. You weren't in the peace of God. And you didn't let it rain richly in your life. So when a circumstance comes, a trial comes, a problem comes, bam, not shoe off, got a flat tire. Walking around two flat tires a piece. If we only give peace a loosely fitting position in our lives, when issues come, it will knock you out of peace. And I'm just going to say, can I be for real? I couldn't preach this sermon like two years ago because it would technically be inappropriate to kind of like knock people for not being in peace during the first worldwide pandemic of our lives. We've kind of been insensitive, inappropriate. But I could talk about it now in a way that a lot of us, come on, me too, a lot of us got the tar kicked out of our peace. We didn't know what to do. We didn't have peace. We didn't have the peace of God that reigned in our hearts and our minds, and therefore we started acting all sorts of ugly. We started feeling all sorts of things. We must position peace firmly in place, binding it around our minds and our emotions in the same way these Roman soldiers bound peace or their shoes very tightly to their feet. When peace has a firm grip in our lives, then we're ready for action. Then we're ready for action. Could you imagine a soldier going into battle with two flat tires thinking he's going to win a fight? There's no stable ground. There's no stable ground. Paul says, having your feet shod with the preparation. This word preparation comes from the word etamasim. And it carries the idea of readiness or preparation. And he's using it in this term for someone's shoes who are tied very tightly and held in place for a firm footing. Firm footing. I think it's easy to not have firm footing when there's so many changes happening around. I mean, there's a lot of changes. The gas prices changed a dollar in one week. Dear God. If I don't want to knock you off, <laughs> knock you out of whack. Right? One week, a dollar, gas prices change, everything's changing. Society's changing. Culture's changing. Hairstyles are changing. <laughs> Always in style, baby. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. With the, with the assurance that your feet are, are, are firm and your shoes are on tight, now you can step into a position of authority, a position of battle, because you know you got the right gear on. It's tightly fastened. You're firmly positioned. When you don't feel firmly positioned, 
There's no confidence. There's no confidence. And that's the battle. The enemy wants you to not have confidence in any area of your life. We're not just talking spiritually. We're talking relationally, employment, financially, health. Want you to have no confidence. But, but God and Paul, that they're kind of saying to us, we, we need you to be on a firm foundation. Paul has carefully chosen his words to denote the action of peace in our lives. And he's telling us when peace is foundational in our lives, we have firm footing. When peace is foundational, we have firm footing. Peace gives us a foundation so secure that we can step out in confident faith without being moved by what we see, by what we hear, and I'm going to add another one, or by what we feel. It doesn't really matter how you feel, God's word is true. God's word is true. The disciples are in a boat with Jesus. The boat is being tore up by a storm. They feel helpless, but the truth is, Jesus is in the boat. So whether the boat is completely destroyed by the storm, they're still going to be safe. <laughs> See, their faith was more in the boat than it was in the Christ that was in the boat. doesn't matter how you feel. What's the truth of the gospel? What's the truth of the gospel? This aggressive, this aggressive peace also puts you in a position to look directly in the enemy's face and handle any challenge that comes at you without fear or intimidation. There's so many people intimidated by the devil. He's defeated. But you know what happens? If you give up, it don't matter if he's defeated or not. You put yourself in a position even lower than him. You put yourself in a position of defeat. Right? If you give up, if you give up, then he can conquer, then he can win, then he can walk over you. But his position is under your feet. So stand firm, the Bible says. Stand firm. Stand firm. Stand firm. Paul continues having your feet shot with the preparation of peace, and he said it gives us a foundation so secure that we can operate in peace. He uses the word arene, arene, and this means a prevailing peace, a prevailing peace, a conquering peace. And when used in a salutation, it means blessings and prosperity in every area of one's life. Blessing and prosperity in every area of one's life. And I'm just asking you, are you experiencing peace in every area of your life? Because it's easy to experience peace in one area. Right, maybe you're healthy now, so health is good, but relationally things are not. Or relationally things are good, but financially they're not. He said, but there's pe peace is supposed to bring this about in every area of your life. By using this word, Paul declares that when an individual receives the truth of the gospel into their heart, it brings blessings and prosperity along with it. When you receive this truth, it receives blessing and prosperity with it. But I want to give you this teaching today in the next 15 minutes that there's two kinds of peace. And if you've never heard this before, I'm really excited to share this with you. Two kinds of peace. The first peace, I would think that it's obvious, but it happens at salvation, it happens at conversion, and it's peace with God. Peace with God. I'm at peace with God. Ever heard someone say, like, before someone was going to die, they made their peace? Here, see that, right? That's getting right with God. Peace with God. God. Peace with God is what a person experiences when they first come to salvation. Once salvation is complete and the hostility of the old sinful nature is gone, 
there's a new peace with God that comes into light. Now, I got to let you understand this. No man can serve two masters. No man can have two natures. Either you have a sin nature or you have a God nature, but you can't have both. At salvation, and, and a lot of people get this wrong, because I hear Christians say, well, you know, if it wasn't for that sin nature that's in me, I would, you don't have, if you're a child of God, you don't have a sin nature. You have a God nature, a salvation nature, God's nature. You are his child, but you do have the flesh. You do have the flesh, and we will war against the flesh daily. There's appetites, desires, things we see. Like, really, if you seclude yourself on an island and you never watch TV again, a lot of your desires would be gone. It's what we see, it's what we feel our mind, fill our minds with all the time that our flesh then desires these things. But hear me out. This is peace with God. Colossians 1.20 says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works now have been reconciled. So it says there was a time before Christ that you were alienated. There was a time before Christ that you did not have the peace. But now, because of the cross, the finished work, receiving Jesus Christ, you've been reconciled. You've been brought, joined together with Christ. Peace with God is a spiritual condition that belongs to every believer. It is a condition that comes when the barrier between God and man is dissolved. If you've ever watched the movie, The Passion of the Christ, it did a great depiction of that. When Jesus is on the cross, he says, Ile, Ile, lama shabachthani. It is finished. Calls out, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is finished. The veil was torn from the top to the bottom. There was this veil that separated the, the temple and the inner courts, the, um, uh, the inner chambers where the priest would go make a sacrifice. And only the high priest could go in there. In fact, it was so sacred that the high priest would have bells attached to his shoes or his clothing, and if they stopped ringing, they knew he died in there because there was some sort of sin in his life. So he'd even have a rope tied around his ankle so that they could just pull him back out of it. So sacred, so holy. Only the high priest could go there. That veil was torn so that we could all access the Father, not just the high priest. That's righteousness. That's peace with God. But then there's a second kind of peace that not every Christian walks in. It's called the peace of God. You have the peace with God, and then you have the peace of God. The peace of God. Peace with God is your right. Peace of God is your choice. It is possible to have peace with God without ever experiencing the peace of God. And I think this is a big problem today. I think it's a big problem today. And I believe there's a lot of Christians who walk around with the peace of God, but they've never stepped into the peace of God. Peace of God. Instead of being dominated by this conquering peace that surpasses all understanding, the people who do not walk in the peace of God walk around constantly fretful, in anxiety, in worry, in turmoil. Because although they have been made right with God, they are positionally children of God, positionally seated at the right hand of God, their human condition has not decided to walk and operate in the peace of God. We want to keep making excuses why it's okay for us to be such a jerk. Why it's okay for us to be upset all the time. Why it's okay for us to talk negative conversations all the time. Like seriously, there are some Christians, they are just the most miserable people in the world to be around. Miserable. You're miserable. And you should have the peace of God. The peace of God. This is the reason that peace has to be a weapon for us. We have to exercise that weapon. The peace of God needs to be a weapon and protection. 
It protects you from anxiety. It protects you from fear. It protects you from worry and anything else that the devil might try to disturb you. But we also have to engage it as a weapon to cast back when something tries to steal your peace. Don't let something steal your peace. Fight back with it. Watch what, watch what we're instructing here in Colossians 3.15. And let... Let, allow it, let the peace of God rule in your heart. The word rule is the Greek word bribo. It means to umpire or referee, a, a umpire or referee who judged the athletic games in the ancient world. So we could say it like this. Let the peace of God call the shots in your life. Let the peace of God make decisions in your life. Let the peace of God umpire your life. Is what I'm feeling right now God or the devil? Let peace umpire that. Let peace decide. Am I feeling the, the Holy Spirit speak to me? Or am I feeling conviction from something else that's not godly? Let peace umpire. My mom and dad raised me like this. Mike, it's like the game Red Light, Green Light. You ever play Red Light, Green Light, one, two, three? Yeah? If you feel a green light, you're feeling peace. If you feel a red light, and I even say a lot of times I saw yellow lights, you're trying to make a decision, it's just like, I don't know, then don't. C can I just give you some advice, man? Don't ever let someone pressure you into buying a car. Pressure, when it's pressure, I'm out, dude. I'm out. Don't pressure me. Don't pressure me to make a decision I'm not ready to make. I got to have the peace that surpasses all understanding. If you're a card salesman, I'm sorry that I just gave your secret away, but shame on you. Let the peace of God referee, you ready for this? Your emotions and your decisions. The devil will take advantage of your unrenewed mind and it will attempt to put you on an emotional roller coaster. Back when I was younger, they would call someone who was emotionally on a roller coaster uh, a manic depressant. You would have manic moments and you'd have depressive moments and it'd be this roller coaster. They don't really use that anymore because it's kind of offensive. Now it's just bipolar. <laughs> Sounds prettier. Safer. It's manic depression, right? Manic depression, bipolar. The, the work of the Holy Spirit, the, the work of the feet shod with the preparation of peace is to even you out. Is to even you out. It's from the kind of, listen, nobody lives on the mountaintop. No one lives on the mountaintop. And if you're like, ah, all the time, you're going to tire people out. We got to knock that down a notch. I mean, I like to get like that in worship. I like that. I, that's why it's loud in here. We got the lights. I'm like, ah, but I don't live there. But I also don't want to live down here where I hate my life. I don't want to look back and hate decisions that I made. I don't want to look back and beat myself up. I should have done this. I should have did that. I should have. That's not healthy. Peace that comes the umpire says, no, 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 no. come on, bring it down a notch. Come on, no, no, no. Come on, bring it up a notch. Come on, we're going to live right in here. We're in this peaceful life, this peaceful place. Remember, the main place that the enemy is going to attack you is in your mind. Why does he attack your mind? Because as a believer, you are already spiritually sealed. He's already lost that battle. If you're a believer in Jesus, you are seated in the heavenly places. You're a child of God. You're on your way to heaven. But he wants to make your life here a living hell. You do that in your mind, torment you. The accuser of the brethren. I want to take a moment today and tell you this. I, I, I had the pleasure this week to uh, go hang out with some buddies of mine. Went down to Florida for a couple days. Hung out with some, some, some buds and did some deep sea fishing. And, and the main reason that we do these kind of trips, they're all pastors, is to take a few days and be accountable 
and be there for each other to see what's going on in our lives. Are you okay? That's the question. That's how dinner is. Every night at dinner, it's a big round table and we talk. Are you okay? What are you dealing with? What are you here this week for? And we're able to open up. It's a safe place for us to just talk. But I'm about to be vulnerable. And please, please don't use my, my moment here of vulnerability to come up and like coach me and give me advice. But on the trip, one of the guys that's invited was a therapist, a counselor. And uh, every single one of us made an hour session to go sit with him and talk with him about something beyond what you want to share at the table. Maybe it's something deeper. Maybe it's a wounding or a scar or something that's been happening. And, and, and even, even then, maybe it's not anything bad. Maybe it's like, hey, man, I need to just bounce a couple ideas off of somebody for some healthy decisions that I'm making. Not, not, not everything's bad. Not everybody's like broken and depressed all the time. I'm not saying that. But this trip specifically was to bring a therapist in, to have one hour, but then also make a lot of connections and friends and have a great time. I'm just, I'm just going to throw this out there to you. There's something special, something spiritual that happens when you can take that burden that you've been carrying for a long time and bring it into the light. Mold grows best in dark places. Mold will kill you. You can't trust everybody to talk to. You can't tell everybody something that's happened in your life. You can't. You just, it's. But what's really nice about a paid therapist is they literally can't tell anybody. They will lose their license and you can sue them. It's perfect. It's great. It's amazing. <laughs> but maybe you've been trying to operate in the peace of God, but you've been dragging around an anchor that's been weighing you down. And as much as you want the peace of God, if you don't let go of this, you can't grab a hold of that. You can't tie peace firmly to your feet when you're holding on firmly to the past. We gotta let that thing go, man. We gotta let the wounds go. We gotta let the pain go. We can't keep making decisions and relationships based upon past woundings. If you're here today, and lately it's just been really hard for you to have peace. I want to pray for you. Whew. Uh. <clears throat> I'm not trying to be weird. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be weird. Just give me a sec. If you're here today, Man, there's somebody here who you, uh, you're at the lowest, the, the depression place you've ever been. And it's been a long time since you've been there and you've actually considered taking your life recently. I've been, I've been there, man. I feel you this morning. I'm not trying to make this a downer, but I, we need some peace. If you're here today and I was a little vulnerable with you, letting you know that I saw a therapist this week. If it's been hard for you to operate in peace, you, anger's been trying to come back. Resentment's been trying to come back. Anxiety's been trying to come back. If, if there's been something attacking your peace and it's been hard to maintain that peace, would you allow me the honor to pray with you this morning? I'm not going to call you to the front, but I do want to know that I'm connecting with you. Could you just raise your hand? Could you raise your hand and say, hey, Pastor Mike, would you pray with me today for peace? Me too. Me too. I see you. I see you. Me too. Me too. Heavenly Father, we come to the name of Jesus. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to understand the things that we've experienced in life and to grow beyond them. We ask today that the Holy Spirit of God would rise up on the inside of every believer, 
Those of us that have taken that chance to step out and raise our hand. Holy Spirit, rise up on the inside of us. Give us the peace that surpasses all understanding. For great is our peace and our undisturbed composure. You will keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. We ask that the peace of God would reign richly in our hearts and in our minds. It would rule the decisions that we make. God, I speak to that thing that's been triggering in our lives, and I call it to be removed now in the name of Jesus. Peace. Peace in the name of Jesus. Take a moment, take a big inhale. We breathe it in, Lord. We breathe the peace of God into our lives, and when moments feel hectic, and when moments feel chaotic, Help us to get our feet firm and breathe in your peace. We will not lose the battle of our mind. We will allow the Holy Spirit free reign and access into our minds. If you're here today and you couldn't really even reach out and be part of that prayer because you haven't even got the peace with God, let alone the peace of God, I'd love to pray with you today to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And just as safe as everything else has been, and I'm not trying to embarrass everybody, I do want to pray with you today. And because we love you so much, we all pray it together. And if you need Jesus today, let's pray this prayer. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Woo! If you're watching online and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you type amen in one of our chat rooms? One of our online hosts would love to send you a digital copy of our devotional called Starting Point. It's going to get you started in your first six days with Christ. If you're in the room today and you prayed that for the first time, would you allow me the honor of celebrating you? I'm not going to call you up or do anything. We're not going to any back room. I just want to cheer you on. If you prayed that prayer for the first time today, would you wave at me real quick and say, hey, Pastor Mike, that was me. I prayed that today. Anybody at all is like, looking? yeah, I see you. Awesome. Yeah, I see you. Yeah, anybody else real quick as I look? At, yeah, I see you. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. We have that same six-day devotional available. Any one of our care team members or ushers have that book as you're heading out. If you came here today and you need prayer for any reason, we will have care team members right here at the front and at the high top tables in the back. Might I suggest if, if you've never been able to sp speak to somebody about what's happening in your life, Maybe call the church office up an appointment with one of our counselors. We have three staff counselors that could set an appointment up with you, both male and female, work through some things in your life, your marriage, how you're raising your kids. I don't know. Just We just need ways to be healthy. Thursday nights, we have Celebrate Recovery. Great program. After church, every Sunday, there's a, there's a, a local NA group that uses the gymnasium. If, if you've been dealing with narcotics, a great, great group of people. Love them with all my heart. Be healthy this year. Right? Do, 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 let the Holy Spirit do what he does, and then you do what you need to do. Father, we thank you and praise you that the word will never return void. It will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor Josh, and if this message has impacted you in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a few things. First, I would love if you would subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 and 11.30 a.m. Second thing is, I'm going to ask that you would take a next step on your journey, and we'd love to help you do that. You can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today. Have a great rest of your day.